And a huge good morning, afternoon, evening to you guys, wherever you are in the world. It's so great to have you with us. I am really excited about our show today. And uh, let's just dive in. Well, if you don't know me, I'm Mark Silber, photographer, educator, and author here in Carmel, California. And before we go any further, make sure you subscribe and enable the bell so you don't miss any of our shows coming up. Our show today is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo Lab. We'll have a link in here to some of their specials. Make sure you take advantage of those because they're going to give you great prints. Okay, now listen, guys, I am really excited to introduce you to our guest today, Peter Asher. He's a legendary record producer and performer. We're going to be talking with him about his book, The Beatles from A to Z, and by the way, he is a CBE, for us Yanks, that means a commander of the British Empire, which is very impressive. Now, his songs with Peter and Gordon form part of my soundtrack growing up. They're indelible in my memory. But today he's going to take us on his alphabetical journey with the Beatles, from A to Z, and he's covering, in the book, he covers the songs and stories behind them and his insights into the music of the Beatles and also his remembrances of John, Paul, George, and Ringo. He met the Beatles in the spring of 1963, which started a lifelong association with the band and its members. He had a front row seat as they elevated pop music into an art form and he was present at the creation of some of the most iconic music of our times. And Peter, welcome to Advancing Your Photography and Creativity. Thank you very much. Thank awesome you. to have you with us. Great to be here. Thank Happy you New Year. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, listen, Peter, it's always a thrill when I <laughs> read a book. And of course, it resonated through my memories. As I said, you, Peter and Gordon, World Without Love is was a huge hit in America. And I think it really, uh, you were part of the British invasion, right? Yes. In fact, uh, yeah, World Without Love was, which is a story unto itself, of course, but it was actually the first number one record of the British invasion other than the Beatles. Is that right? Um, obviously, the first one was Why Want to Hold Your Hand. Yes. Um, and then uh, about six months later, I suppose, that they had, then they had a whole bunch of hits, obviously. But the first non-Beatles number one after that was... Um, I was uh, well without love. Yeah, so then we became part of the British invasion. But uh, let's not forget the whole thing was, you know, it was Beatle-led. You know, I always say the British invasion was like 90% the Beatles and 10% all the rest of us put together. So They opened it, the door for you. Would, they opened the door entirely. And, and what people don't realize, except people, incredibly ancient people like me who were alive in that era, that before that, British acts did not have hits in America at all. Right. I mean, it was extremely rare and they were often like odd one-off hits you know rock island line was a hit for lonnie donegan but the big his lonnie donegan's biggest hit was does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost <laughs> i remember not that. musical ground <laughs> and then there was things like aka bilk stranger on the shore which was a clarinet solo i mean but that you was it remember those so, no, yeah but that was a big hit it was number one but uh in general British acts did not make it in America because the perception correctly was British acts were just copying American rock and roll, which is exactly what we were doing. You were. So the very fact that suddenly everything would get turned around, we would fall in love with your music, tweak it a bit and sell it all back to you was an entirely unexpected phenomenon. And, and, and in it, that's why it was so astonishing at the time. You don't forget Capitol Records turned down the first three Beatles singles. I, re I know. I read that they in your had, book. Didn't, they didn't think they had a chance of making it. So British acts couldn't get the time of day in America until the Beatles. You know, it's what an interesting phenomenon where you, where you were picking up American music, American rock and roll, and feeding it back to us. Yeah. And, you exactly. know, and, and the whole flow just kind of reversed. So from America to, Brit to Britain and then back to America again, which is yes. remarkable. Yes, well, we, we, we believe that we... Appreciated, to be honest, we thought that we appreciated and understood American music, particularly rhythm and blues, which we were all crazy about, um, more than the Americans did. And it was true, uh, actually. I, I think mean, that is true. Yeah. I'll give you one, one moment of truth. I mean, we all loved Little Richard. 
you know, the Beatles, as you know, were big Little Richard fans. Yeah, McCartney got a picture there. Co copied Little Richard as, as best he could. And uh, and uh, so we loved them. And Tutti Frutti was um, a, a huge hit in England. We all had that record, that Little Richard record. Right. And we couldn't believe our eyes because we could look at the American charts in a magazine called Melody Maker. And when we looked at the American charts, Little Richard was nowhere to be found. But the Pat Boone version of Tutti Frutti, which is <laughs> was number one so you know and we kind of went they don't get it you know they don't get it at the time you didn't and which is often the case you know about a prophet not being recognized in his own country and all that stuff so it's it's not it's not surprising but it was certainly true we you know when when american artists who would play clubs to an inattentive audience you know blues artists yeah like Big bill brunzi or rosetta tharp or any of those people would come to london they'd be treated like the gods they were in America. They were, they were ignored. Well, there's that story we'll probably get to about Jimi Hendrix, who I was, I had the fortune of meeting and I saw it in your book that you did too. Yeah. briefly. Uh, yeah. But, but he was basically, nobody was paying any attention to him in the United States. And when he went to London, all of a sudden he was a huge hit. And just, yes, yes. There's a number of factors to that, but yes, that's certainly true. Okay, Peter, I have to lead in here just by asking you this question. So I love to hear from you what it was like to witness and, you know, front row seat doesn't even do, do justice to it. Like, for instance, I, you write in your book about uh, John and Paul. Paul was living in your parents' house. Amazing. And they went to the music room in the basement and they put together, I want to hold your hand. And then Paul kind of says, hey, Peter, you want to come and hear this song? <laughs> what was that like? Yeah. You're the first person uh, in the well, world to hear described, it. You, you just <laughs> described it. Um, yeah, that was sorry. the story. I mean, at the time, you don't necessarily realize that something is as remarkable an event as it is. I mean, Paul, he lived in our house for about two years, I think, and he and I shared the top floor. And there was a little basement music room, as you say, that my mother used to give oboe lessons in. She was a professional classical musician. And she wasn't giving private lessons much anymore because she was very busy at the Royal Academy of Music. So she had told Paul he could use that piano whenever he wanted to. And yes, on that particular day, John had come over. I think one of the interesting facts is that they were in that room with just the piano. There were no guitars. Yes. yes. So that was a purely piano song at the time. Of course, by the time it came out, it was a guitar song. I and never would have guessed. Ever. And uh, they wrote it on piano. And yeah, Paul said, we've just finished this song. Do you want to hear it? And I, I sat on this little sofa and they sat side by side on the small upright piano and played I Want to Hold Your Hand for the first time anywhere to anyone. And and uh, I told them I thought it was amazing. Um, and I think the the ultimate clue to what I thought is that I, I asked them, could they please play it again? And And of wow. course, that's what makes for a hit record. You know, that's that's the definition of a hit is the minute it finishes, you you wish it hadn't stopped. And you, you you know, in the old days, you would yank the needle on your 45 back to the that's opening right. groove so you played again until it wore out. And and the other indicator, of course, is that they were delighted to play it again. They, they knew just how good it was, I think. Did you have any sensation? I mean, when you were listening to that, did you <clears throat> was there some spark of recognition that, wow, this thing is going to go really far and it's going to. Uh, I didn't think in those terms. I, I mean, I thought it was incredibly good. I thought everyone would like it. I thought it would be a hit. Yeah. But I think it would change music forever and, and we'd still be talking about it, whatever, God knows, 60 years later or whatever it is. Um, yeah, many years. No, I didn't think about that. Yeah. But I did think it was it was incredibly good. I knew of them, as I say, I knew it was going to be a hit and everyone would like it. But I didn't know that the world would go insane and that the, the you know, Beatlemania would take hold of the womanhood of the world and everyone would go crazy. It's amazing. I didn't know that. Well, we were talking about this before the show. You know, again, part of my soundtrack was that song. And the most, I think the most amazing thing about the Beatles for me personally is how they were somehow mystically paralleling things that were going on in my life. Now, is it art imitating life or life imitating art? I don't know. But, you know, I think I Want to Hold Your Hand came out when I was 12, and that's about the best that you could hope for. <laughs> and yeah. and as yes. they progressed, you know, beyond holding hands, I progress. you know, I was like tracking right along with them. What do you yeah. think that quality is that, that caused them to be so in tune with 
Oh, I think people, they just write songs that occur to them at the time. I think that's a matter of good fortune. I don't actually see anything magical about it. It's, it's you know, good songs like good books and good music and, you know, um, good movies and everything ha resonate with people. They, just they, resonate, they mean yeah. things to people that, that the songwriter didn't even think of at the time. Yeah. You know, great songs are the ones where people think, oh, this is exactly me. And, and, and yet the songwriter probably was thinking about something completely different you know so um but that's that's what makes art valuable it's it's so true now on that note so in your book you um i have it marked here you're you're talking about art and that's really apropos to our conversation today in terms of creativity you said when writing about music one is indeed often circling around one of the most mysterious questions where does great art come from and you, you talk about a little bit, what, what are your thoughts about that? That, you know, you've been around not just the Beatles, but a lot of great artists. And you talk about in this book how their inspiration formed their art. But can you shed some more light on that? I wish I could. And that's, that's a big question. With, with, and we, nobody knows. You ask artists, they don't know. Yeah. Every songwriter I've, I've ever talked to about this issue, all, they all say that we don't know. You know, some of them get all spiritual and about it, and some of them think it's coming from God or whatever. Yeah. Some, some, you know, uh, we don't know. I mean, there, there's that famous story. You know, Paul McCartney was in our house at the time, and you know, when he woke up with the melody from yesterday uh, written in his head, unbelievable. He woke up with that song stuck in his head, like a like, and he was convinced that it was an existing song that he'd remembered. And he was asking everybody that day and following days if they knew what the song was. Uh, I wasn't there that day, so I didn't. I, I missed this particular event. But I know that he asked my mother, who of course is a professional musician, and and uh, she said that she didn't know it. And uh, but he was singing the melody of yesterday to people, going, "What what is this song that's stuck in my head?" And finally, by sort of a process of elimination, he realized that he'd written it. And I mean, that's quite unusual. I mean, oh, that degree of, of pre, you know, but but he didn't know where it came from. Nobody knows. Uh, you know, and, and there's, there's a very good documentary about Ed Sheeran called Songwriter, I think, about how he wrote songs and where they come from. In, in terms of the how, and there was a similar conclusion, which nobody knows. But, yeah. um, but I think most people start songs by actually copying someone else. Right. Very often in pop music, certainly, and probably in classical music, too. People go, well, you know, I love that song, so-and-so. I'm going to do something like that. And you actually start off trying to vaguely copy a couple of licks from that song and write around it and uh, come up with something completely different. Might be good, might be bad, but, um, you know, in an effort to copy, and the same goes for, so it goes for st musical styles as well. I mean, when Gordon and I started singing together, we just wanted to sound as much like the Everly Brothers as we possibly could. And we failed in that mission. But uh, we, in, in, the pro in the process of failing to sound exactly like the Everly Brothers, we sounded pretty cool. And we kind of went, well, this blend is all right. It's not the Everly's, but it's different. And so that was us. And, uh, and, and that's kind of how it happens. You know, I, I, I had a conversation with David Crosby once, and I was telling him about how much we, we were trying to copy the Everly's and how we were trying to copy American music in general. And, and I said, well, you, you were probably, you know, going for the Everly sound as well when the birds got together. And he went, no, he said, no, no, we wanted to sound like you. Is that uh, right? Really? <laughs> you know, he wow. said, no, when he and Chris Hillman started singing together, they looked, the Peter and Gordon was one of their, not, you know, not their soul, of course, but one of their archetypes because at that time the British invasion had happened and, the birds thought we want to sound like those cool English bands. So, so, and, and they didn't succeed, but they came up with the sound of the birds, which is totally fantastic and made some brilliant, brilliant records. So, you know, the, one of the main um, motivations of, of um, for, for, for creating art is attempted plagiarism, in my view. I mean, you start off going, I'm going to write a song like that song because it's so good. And you'll, the Beatles talk about this a lot and i mentioned in the book that they often say we started off wanting to write something you know when paul wrote i'm down apparently um he was writing he wanted to write something like uh long tall sally 
because they'd been closing the show with Long Tall Sally for a long Amazing. time. Paul's tour de force, Little Richard thing. So he wanted to write a similar Little Richard style rocker, you know, and came up with I'm Down, uh, which is great. But its its origin was an attempt to kind of replace Long Tall Sally on the on the menu. And you know, uh, Peter, this is a really good point because we talk about this a lot in terms of getting inspired. And you know, this whole point of looking at other people's music, listening to their music, li looking at photographs, whatever your art form is, or writing for that matter. I mean, it's a known fact that this this <clears throat> is part of your own evolution is 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 trying to emulate those people that really resonate for you. Well, look how many classical pieces are based on variations on a theme by, you know? Yeah. I mean, Bach's uh, probably most famous piece, the Goldberg Variations, based on a, a piece that was already written. And he went, I like that. I'm going to write, you know, how many it is, 40 something, I think, variations on that theme. Some of them I can't even quite tell what the theme is, but because um, he's, he's, Bach has recreated it so yeah. imaginatively. But you know, that happens in pop music and everywhere else as well. An interesting recent example is, is Springsteen's latest album. He he wrote uh, he wrote several songs that were very Dylan-esque songs, but he didn't release them at the time because he was getting a bit of flack about copying Dylan. Well, and, yeah, and, and, and you know, let's not forget, Dylan started off getting flack for copying Woody Guthrie. Exactly, he learned from Woody, so, right? Yeah, so you know that's how that's how it works. It's a chain of flack, you know, going yeah. back. And yeah. he he really yeah. he really did have that that Woody Guthrie sound, and he learned flat picking, I think, from Woody and carried that. Yeah, sort of no, there's no question that that's that's how it's done. And and I think one of, one one of the key things is picking the right people to copy. And in that category, you'd certainly include Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan, Absolutely. and and the Everly Brothers, and Buddy Holly, and Little Richard, and all the people who influenced the Beatles as well. Amazing. Well, I mean, it is it's definitely part of, of art is going out and finding those sources of inspiration and bringing them into your own universe, as it were, and, and finding your own twist on it. How can you how can you take whatever it is that inspired you and, and turn it around and make it your own? Yep. For sure. So, you know, some of the other things that fascinated me were just the fact that your mother taught George Martin the oboe, right? Yes, he, he was a, a student at the Guildhall School of Music. Um, some of the books suggest that my mother was a professor there. She was not. She was a professor at the Royal Academy of Music, which is a separate, entirely separate institution. But uh, when you're at the Guildhall, you have to, in, in addition to your primary course, what they would call a major here in America, uh, George was studying composition and piano, uh, and conducting, I think. You you have to take a second instrument as well, and he had decided upon the oboe. And he had some exams coming up and thought his oboe playing was not up to snuff and looked for an independent oboe teacher to um, to polish up his playing. And he was recommended to my mother, not as because she didn't teach at the Guildhall, but she did take private pupils. So this was him venturing out for additional instruction. And so he was a pupil of my mother's and came... Uh, probably before we lived in Wimple Street, it was probably when we were in a flat nearby as a family, that she would give lessons there. And it's, he came there to uh, have oboe lessons to, to get past the oboe part of his exams at, at the Guildhall, which he, successfully, which he successfully did. So it was odd. So when she met him some years later as, the, as her daughter's boyfriend's record producer, um, uh, it, she already knew him. You know, one of the things I didn't know when I uh, until I read your book was how many musicians that that we participated that we didn't really know. You mentioned, for instance, Nicky Hopkins played with John Lennon. Nicky was a friend of mine back back when. F fantastic piano player. He played with the Stones too. I I think. Yeah, he played. He played on the first record I ever produced too. He was my favorite piano. No player. kidding! Wow. First record I produced. Uh, it's it's a fairly long story, but it's a relatively short version of. Um, a guy called Paul Jones, who was the lead singer of Manfred Mann. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the do I did he period. Yeah. There she was, just yeah. a, that guy. Um, Let's hear it. I, <laughs> no, I produced some records with him. And the first record I ever produced, I wanted to make sure I had a good rhythm section because I wanted things to go well. I decided that produ record production was a career I set my mind on. So I uh, hired Nicky Hopkins to play piano. 
my friend Paul Samuel Smith played bass, who was the bass player in the Yardbirds. Oh yeah. And and also went on to be a record producer himself and produced Carly Simon and Cat Stevens, all the good records by them. Wow. And uh and then I asked him if he could ask his guitar player friend who had recently become the guitar player in the Yardbirds, if he could come and play too. Because at that time I didn't know Jeff Beck. So but I got asked Paul to ask him. So Jeff Beck is playing guitar on that record. And uh uh, Paul McCartney is playing drums because I loved his drumming. So it was a that's the first record I did, and that was Nicky. And who knew Paul could play drums? I mean, again, you know. Well, I'd heard him play obviously in this house, so su um, super. I knew surprising. how good he was. Yeah, he could play anything. And then you know, Clapton played at least on what my guitar gently weeps. Was he also present for some other recordings? Uh. Didn't play on that many Beatles, actual Beatles tracks. Not many, yeah. but he did play on my guitar, Gently Weeps. It was George's guitar, but but <laughs> Eric was doing the weeping. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but he played, of course, a lot on all the other stuff that the Beatles did solo and produced and so on. You know, when George produced Jackie Lomax, uh, when the first thing he did for Apple, which is a very good album, I went to some of those sessions because they were so good. I mean... Ringo was playing drums most of the time. Um, Klaus Vorman playing bass, and Eric Clapton and George Harrison playing twin guitars. So, that, those were good sessions. Speaking of Klaus, I had no idea that he had designed the cover. Was it Revolver that yes. he did the cover? So he was an yeah. incredible graphic artist. In addition yes, to being an, a brilliant bass player. Yeah, he was and is. Klaus is uh, doing fine and is still a great graphic artist and a great bass player. Did he do any other uh, cover designs for them? Don't think so. That I mean, the Revolver. If you guys haven't seen it, and and uh, ha have a look at that album with their eyes cut out, and I've seen a version of that where you, their eyes are actually moving. So they must have shot a video, or somebody did an animated version of it. I guess so. But Klaus, uh, did he play with the Beatles? I know he played with George, right? Did, uh, I don't think he's ever ever played with. Uh, certainly not live, but yeah, I don't think he's played with the Beatles now. Amazing. He was, Again, he was very good friends with them all, obviously. Right. Again, all these other players that we wouldn't necessarily know behind the scenes, and that kind of leads me to a, a question. You can answer this or not, but are there any things that people would be really surprised or even shocked to learn about the Beatles? Oh, undoubtedly, but I don't know quite what they would be. <laughs> I'm sure they could come up with something shocking. Uh, no, I don't. I, I can't. Nothing I would define in that way, no. Well, is it? Okay, so I have one. Is it true that they didn't read or write music? That is true. You know, there's a tradition in rock and roll. I mean, all their heroes, I mean, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, you know, no, nobody read and wrote, wrote and wrote and read music, I don't think. Uh, you know, because it comes from a whole blues tradition where nothing was written down you know? right even the lyrics were just passed down like stories um so it, it doesn't really surprise me i remember back in the time people were wow, what do you mean how can you write a song if you can't write music well the answer is you know then the, you know <clears throat> not being able to read music was like a badge of well i'm a real musician now that's much less true uh now than it was then it's true that back then journalists would all go, you know, really, you guys can't read music? And, you, you know, I can a very little bit and, and Paul learned to a very little bit. But no, essentially, none of us can or could. And I, of course, should have been able to, having grown up in a musical household. I just didn't take my piano lessons seriously and and seemed to do fine without reading music. I mean, both my sisters read music better than I do, so... But you get into some very... why I'm, I'm the one making a living in the music business. <laughs> Isn't that funny? But... Uh, Peter, you get into some pretty technical explanations about their songs. It, it Sometimes, sounds, yeah. It sounds yeah. like you, you really... Now, okay, so they didn't read or write music. However, they obviously knew the names of the chords, right? And por chord progression. Some of them. Not, some of no, I mean, we, we didn't know them. I mean, there's lots of chords we didn't know the name of. You know, when they came out with... Um, the At the end of She Loves You, I guess it is. That there's that sixth chord at the very end on the last year. And... They didn't know what it was. They just discovered it, They're trying out notes and and going. This is listen to this. No one's no one's ever heard this before. This is amazing. And George Martin, of course, said, "Well, actually, people have heard of that. It's called the sixth. And yes, it sounds great." So they so, had George as their George Martin as their kind of m musical mentor that could 
yes pull things he, he, out like he can speak the language but but it's not essential it's helpful to be it's a way of communication it's handy you know i wish i could i have a general grasp of music theory but my reading is terrible and and it barely exists and and uh you know, I, I wish I had a better grasp of it because it isn't makes it easier to communicate with some musicians. But the snootiness about that has largely disappeared in the same way that the snootiness between classical music and pop music has has disappeared substantially. Um, but in both directions, it, it, you're much more likely to find great classical musicians playing with great pop musicians than you ever were back then. And if you did back then, there was no question about who was slumming. You know, the but now, you know, when you see Yo-Yo Ma and James Taylor on stage together, they, they are there as equals. And does James read and write music, just out of curiosity? No. Okay. No. So they were learning by ear. And and I yes. assume chord, like in a, uh, you know, the way I learned songs was I'd look at the chord and I learned, okay, this is a D or an E or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Well, they, they And then you'd find someone who knew a couple of chords you didn't know and they'd teach them to you. It was like, wow. I remember a story. Yeah. I, I don't remember if it was in your book or elsewhere, but Ooh. they the Beatles pretty much started out with something like three chords and then one day George brought in a new chord and everybody was super excited. And Yeah, that happens. Yeah, exactly. And just like, wow, we've got four chords, now five. Let's use that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, we talked about this a little bit, but I want to drill down if you don't mind. I, I am fascinated by the fact that every, every album was a reinvention. It wasn't, you, you know, listen, there's many artists, I, I'm, I'm not sliding them, but Album one and album eight, I don't hear a lot of difference. I hear new songs, but I, it's, it sounds very similar to me. But the Beatles, every new album was very different. Yes. Dil, Dylan had a way of doing that as well. Uh, but very few artists can reinvent themselves with each new album. What was it that drove that, as far as you know? I, I don't know. You, 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 you mentioned that question earlier, and I, I told know. you I didn't know the answer. Uh, no, I mean, you, it's, that's what happens in, if you happen to get four. It, it, that's related to the question of, you know, why did the Beatles happen? You know, what, yeah. what, what was it? And what it was, was just it? <laughs> the four exceptional musicians, all extraordinary on their own, each of whom would have gone, a lot, gone ahead to remarkable careers, I believe. Of yeah. whatever it happened, even if they never met, and so it was like a perfect storm, you know, just four perfect musicians who who had had each contributed to a collective genius that was extraordinarily creative and created a body of work in a very short time that has never been equaled. And and you know why or how that happens, I suppose it, you know, it's the real answer is kind of why not? You know, those four people did meet up. They might not have, and yeah. history would be different. And there might be other great bands who are failing to get together and meet each other at this very moment that will never know what music they would have written. But, you know, it's it's uh, it's the randomness of the universe, I suppose. It, I, you know, I don't believe there's any purpose to any of this. So, so in my view, it's just, oh, that happened. Great. You know, they and met. It, Good thing. Good yeah. thing they did. Well, I think there was a spirit of innovation that that uh, and, and as their popularity grew and they could do more and more stuff. Oh, in yeah. The, in of the course, they, they grew up. They wanted to write songs about things other than, you know, um, well, you know, at the time, every song, every hit was just a basic love song from me to you. Yes. As it was. yes. And uh, and uh, they changed that. You know, even She Loves You was it was an innovation. Suddenly they were writing the third person. It wasn't I love you. It wasn't you. Will you love me? It was she loves you. At the time, there weren't many songs like that. So even as simple a change as that Amazing. took pop music in a in a step forward towards greater literacy, great greater, you know, use of language. And then when you start to write whole songs that that create another universe, you know, now other people and characters like she's leaving home is a story and it's a story about people we, we almost feel we know and what you, here's what the parents thought and here's what the girl thought and you know um you know it, it's a desire to get better which i think is a very human desire and the beatles had the power and the wherewithal and the talent to do it and they did it every this time is, this is say. so uh, you know important to us as creatives whether again, <laughs> as photographers or writing or whatever it's just that yeah that spirit of uh, i want to i want to create something i want to communicate something i want to yes. innovate right yes well, and part of it's ambition we want to be successful we want everyone to love us that's part of it sure every artist has felt that way you know um 
when any when anyone moans about the burdens of fame, I have zero sympathy. I agree. Oh, no, Peter. Nobody ever gets famous by accident. Well, I mean, that's not quite true, but famous for their own accomplishments by accident. You can get famous for something else you do. But, but um, you know, they, they wanted to be the, the biggest band in the world, and they were. I think but the, the good thing is it was justified. They got to be the biggest band in the world because they were the best band in the world. They really were. You know, I think it goes back to that 10,000 hour theory of here That's they were. That's a lot of it. And they right? spent those 10,000 hours in, in Hamburg and in, in Hamburg. club and getting better all the time. They just paid their dues. I mean, didn't they pay play like 10 hours a day or something? I mean, I think so, yeah. I mean, obviously I didn't know them then at all, but, but, but I believe so. You, you get pretty good after 10 hours a day of practice, yes. right? Yeah. So when they yep. did come back to England and, and uh, start putting <clears throat> those songs on, on vinyl, then they, they had it down. They knew what they were doing. Yes. I think the other thing that's fascinating is their production schedule was so intense that they didn't have time to fool around in the studio, from what I understand. They had to get those tracks down. And yeah, move things move very quickly then. You, you know, this day you're going to cut three songs. Next day you're going on television. Next day you've got, got a gig. And it was like that for us and for them. And obviously more intense for them because was different but i mean they were the beatles but but uh yes th things zipped right along in that era you touched on something i just want to bring up to this this moaning about the you know being famous and you know i think uh, paul mccartney is such a good example of of somebody who has grown you know with humility <clears throat> and and staying in touch with his fans i mean i always feel like he he goes out of his way to do a lot of interviews and and be accessible, and that's obviously part of his his philosophy as an artist. He's not high. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, if you go back to the original Beatle cliches when they first hit the scene, you know, they like most cliches. They have a basis in reality. Paul was and is the the most charming, the most friendly, the one who'll remember your name and yeah. you know all that stuff. George was the quiet one. Ringo was the funny one. John was the potentially acerbic one. So, <laughs> you know, it, it was all true. It's true. You know, another thing, Peter, is aside from music, they had this um, such a likable spirit to them. You know, I, yeah. Yeah. the word insouciance, which just means this carefree attitude, right? Yes. Was, was was captivating. I mean, we were just wanted to be part of that. We were, we, I, I, you know, you felt like kind of like they're your friends and you just want to be part of that world. Yes. Yes. And I think that's another quality that's that, that, that rubbed off on, you know, us as yeah, a well, generation. In the same way that their musical talents blended, so did their personalities. I mean, they were funny, you know, um, and charming and, and enthralling. Amazing. And you got to also be, you know, you were became head of A&R at Apple. So you got to witness and be part of that whole part of the evolution, which is bringing other artists into their into their world. Yeah. Right. Yes. And was that that was sort of one of their missions was like, OK, now we've made it. We want to start helping other artists take off. Like Very James much. Taylor. Yeah, I mean, Apple, as you may know, when we began it, you know, I'd started off. Paul had explained the whole concept to me and we talked about it a lot, mostly at his house, but by this time he'd moved out of our house. And uh, uh, he, he explained the idea of Apple and that it was going to be much more artist friendly and receptive than companies were at the time. And we took an ad, you know, we took a bad ad saying, send us your music, send us your tapes. We will listen. And we did. Amazing. Uh, um, you know, I had a staff of about four people, four or five listening to all the tapes that came in and unfortunately it was all awful but that's another story but um we never got anything from all the send-in tapes that we, that we that we hoped to get um but nonetheless you know paul asked me if i wanted the job as head of a and r for apple to be in charge of who we signed and uh, i happily accepted and the first act who actually got signed to apple was james taylor that's amazing Peter, I have some. Uh, so actually, we have the cover. I'm going to just pull it up here from. Well, actually, uh, I think that's an old cover, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's the not revolver. Nice. There's revolver for those. Yeah, revolver. Yeah, but the book cover it doesn't matter at all. But oh, I'll bring a, the book up too. I was no, going to go not, through this. That's not the cover. But this is an interesting mix of photographs and uh, his own drawings, and those eyes are their eyes, apparently. I mean. Yes, I guess so. Again, I've seen a version of it where the eyes are moving around, but this is Klaus Vorham right uh design this yes. for him 
Yes. And wasn't it something like 30 pounds or something that he got? I think I remember. I believe so, yes. I, I remember researching all that. It, it wasn't very much. It was yeah, the EMI's maximum fee for an album cover, I think. Unbelievable. Uh, let's 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 look at some of the some of the other images. I'm going to uh, bring you up on the side here so we can see you. Uh, I have to read. It's, it's curious because actually the that cover you got is not the cover. I know. I have that cover. <laughs> I, I found it that. At all. I'm totally fine with it. But that was the one that didn't get used. I see. I know. I just I pulled that up just really for the purposes of your intro. No, no, it's fine. I just was curious. It's interesting that you somehow you came across a cover that was a reject cover. They never actually put that one out. That's, I, you know, and I, I thought it worked well in your intro. But let's look at some of these other photographs here. So okay. there's your cover. Yeah. And um, by the way, you guys, Jared, put the well, link in it there. It is the cover. But yes, you know. I, this is I'm the actual you. cover. Jared, will you stick the link in there so oh, yeah, that Jared, everybody can... That's yeah, that's the real cover. Make yeah. sure after the show you get over there and buy this. On uh, we'll put it in there on, from Amazon. But here's some other. Th this yeah, the is paperback just came out, as you probably know. It came out at the end of last year. Oh, good. Uh, um, so this is you and Paul. Yes, what? I think that's a Mary Hopkins session, but Ma I guess Mary's not in that picture. It got but cropped think, for some reason. Yeah, I think that's us at a Mary Hopkins session. What year do you think this is? I'm very bad at dates. Okay. Uh, I guess wrong usually, but I suppose it would be 66. Yeah, like that. that's kind of what I, you know, from what, Ooh. just looking at Paul, I would say. Or maybe a bit later, because, no, if it's Mary Hopkin, it's Apple years, I think. But we can't see Mary, so who knows? Okay. And then uh, who, who are we looking at here? That's you and that's Paul. That's John Dunbar's wedding. Um, John Dunbar was my friend with whom I started an art gallery in a bookshop called Indica. Oh, yes. That's on the left, it's Miles, Barry Miles, a very good writer. You may know he did the biography of Paul McCartney and many other books on the 60s. So it's Barry Miles on the left, then John Dunbar, then his soon-to-be wife, Marianne Faithful, and uh, me and Paul. Indica is where John and Yoko first met, right? Yeah, correct. That's a whole story into itself. It is. Okay, we'll save that for another time. Whenever, whenever but it's it's a story. Quite a story. And then uh, the they're coming back from uh, India, is that right? Or I can't remember. No, I wasn't in India, so oh, okay. Um, we're all coming back from somewhere. I think New York. I think and he's we carrying in, a sitar there, George. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and that's George and Patty, uh, Ringo and his wife Maureen, and myself, Pine Maureen. You were, you were more than a front row seat. <laughs> I mean, you were part of this whole thing. Yeah. Peter, did you feel like, wow, I, I'm just, this is unbelievable that I get to witness all these things that are going on? Or was it just sort of so natural to you that it didn't seem? It, seemed, it didn't seem quite that. No, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I had to pinch myself. I couldn't believe I was there. Because I was mostly working, you know, we, was, you yeah. know, we were doing stuff and just trying to do it right. But yes, it, it, it it felt obviously it was a privilege to know the Beatles and to occasionally even get to watch them work or whatever. That was exciting. And one was aware of it. You could not realize they were Beatles because everywhere you went as a Beatle, things were different because people looked at you differently and behaved differently. And, you know, you, everyone got, had to try and get used to that. But, but, um, uh, but, but some of the time, as I say, one was just working with some friends. Amazing. Working with friends. Okay, so here's a couple of more. What do we have? Oh, yes. Uh, so you do host the the uh, Beatles channel on Sirius, right? Once a week? Yeah, it's a show called From Me to You on the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. I've been doing it a couple of years now, or three years maybe, because I know we've recorded about 180 shows. Um, uh, you know, they asked me to do that when when Sirius finally got permission, made a deal with the Beatles to have a Beatles channel, which they'd always wanted, of course. And we took a lot of negotiating and then asked me if I'd like a show. I checked with Apple and with the Beatles um, to make sure that it, this was an invitation that came from them, not just serious, right. but it was. And so I was happy to do it and I have fun doing it every week. What, what day is it on? We'll make sure we all tune in. It, it, it's on, on Thursday nights. I think it's 8 PM. Uh, I can't remember now. Okay. Um, we'll check it. Then out. it repeats on, Tuesdays and Saturdays and Sundays or something. It's a 
complicated schedule, but if I'm sure the Sirius XM website will make it all clear. I'm sorry, I should know in my head, be able to plug my own show, but but I always forget when it's on too. Jerry I know might it's be able to night. find that in the in the link. No, then, night and then then several repeats. Let's take a look at this photograph for a minute because this is such an iconic image of them walking across Abbey Road, and of course Paul being barefoot set off this whole. You know, Paul is dead thing, and yes, not yeah. because he was barefoot. It meant that he was dead. I mean, I don't know who. Do you think John started all that? I mean, I've heard no, no, him. absolutely not. Nobody did. Some, some, somebody just, some wacko just started picking up these pieces. I think it was it was Q. Uh, Q. Okay. The, Q, the QAnon people started this. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's a. I think it's you're about right. Years. Yeah, exactly. It's got the same amount of truth to it. About the same amount of truth, exactly. And here's Paul, uh, you know, and Ringo being. But this is such an, um, I don't know. Again, we talked about how they how they had the spirit of the times. And, you know, this was, they look so cool. cool. I got to tell you, Peter, they were so cool. Each of them in their own. You oh, know, yeah. Well, they were cool. They are cool. There's no, no, no doubt about it, you know. Um, Ringo and Paul are still exceptionally cool. They and really and are. George was one of the coolest people in the world to ever meet, certainly. And John in his white suit and flowing Absolutely. hair and just yeah, tennis exactly. shoes. It's, yeah. it's the coolness that does not go away either. It doesn't no. change. No. It's, it's going Correct. to be with us forever. It's like Beethoven, yes. I guess. Yeah. So let's see what else we have here. Just, uh, yeah. So here you are at a recording session, I imagine, right? Yeah, that's John, obviously, and George and me and George Martin um, listening to a playback. Somebody actually figured out which song it must have been, and now I can't remember. Mark, I think it was Mark figured it out, but because um, uh, they knew, they realized that we were, it was a day that we and the Beatles were in two, the two studios next to each other, and I was obviously visiting, and it, it looks as almost as if I'm trying to adopt the George Martin pose. You know, yes, to, in a way. Yeah. A, a hero of mine. Um, a, a nerdy footnote for anyone who's interested is that we are, I, I know we were listening to a playback. I, I remember that much. And of course, what's interesting is we're all grouped around one speaker rather than standing in the middle like you oh, would be that's now. that's right. Because everything was mono. So even though we're all on what the, the desk is actually next to John in that direction, the, the mixing desk. But so we're, we're standing all on completely on one side of the room. But of course, if you're in mono, that doesn't matter. You can still hear the playback properly. And how many tracks was that? Four. Four tracks mixed to one. Yes. Unbelievable. I mean, now now that we have Pro Tools and all these incredible digital things that we can Yeah, do. it obviously went up. I mean, 8-Tracks was next. And that, you know, first record they ever did on 8-Track was uh, Hey Jude. Because I, I'd done, I wanted to do the James Taylor album I was producing on 8-Track. So I went to a studio called Trident Studios because they had already got an 8-track machine. Yeah. EMI actually had one, it turned out, but they were still testing it and setting it up to their standards and all that stuff. But uh, So I went to, to Trident to do to the James Taylor album. Paul came there to play on a song called Carolina In My Mind for me. Sure. And, and, and like the studio, so he ca then came back with all the Beatles uh, to a session which I was fortunate enough to attend, which was Hey Jude. And they... And they did Hey Jude was, was the first record they ever did on 8-Track. Unbelievable. You know, Peter, one of the things I, I try to debunk often is this sort of obsession over equipment and the latest thing, latest software, latest gear, whatever. And here's an example of the Beatles doing these iconic records with four tracks, mono. Yeah, no, it's, and it, which was very hard. They were very good four-track machines. The Studer half-inch four-tracks were terrific sounding. But... Yeah, it's very hard because you have to make a lot of decisions as you go. Yeah. Because your first four tracks, you mix them down to one on another machine, and those decisions you made in that mix are permanent. So it's tricky. Amazing. So you, know, you learned how to do it. And then there's uh, there's James. Yeah. And that was recorded on a track uh, in Los Angeles. You know, we did the first album was the Apple album, and this, then we left Apple, and I became James's manager and moved to America in 1970, made a deal with Warner Brothers Records and produced this first American album, Sweet Baby James, which, as I say, was done, done here in L.A. Another remarkable story, again, for another time of, you know, one, one of the things we talk about and I talk about in my book, Create, is just 
uh, dispelling this idea that creatives have this sort of magical life that everything just, you know, happily goes along. And of course, this is not true at all. And, and the ability to overcome barriers and obstacles is, is probably what sets these guys apart, is they didn't give up. And James didn't give up, even though he hit some, some really hard times. Yes. He, you know, he, he pulled himself back up and, and relaunched himself in his career, right? Yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah. that's another story. Um, yeah, that's a long story. <laughs> but luckily, a story which is still going on. Of course, James is still making great records. And he really is. He's still a dear friend of mine and, and so on. Amazing. And then here's, I think we have one last, which is, which is Paul smoking a cigarette. And you guys, do you, is there any story behind this? I can't remember where that was, no. Uh, I mean, I've, obviously, I've seen the picture, but it, it, it doesn't ring a bell with me. And uh, I never smoked, oddly enough, even in that era when everyone did. But yeah, Everybody was smoking, smoking back then. Something. Yeah, yeah. And there's, uh, this is, I, I think, the Wings era, right? I, I... Uh, probably, yes. It's backstage. At a, it's a rather tiny picture. But yeah, it's a tiny picture. Me and Paul and Linda and Linda, of course, the two Lindas. Oh, look at that. Okay. Linda McCartney and Linda Ronstadt. Well, Peter, I think we should uh, see if there's some questions out there. I have, I have oh, okay. endless questions, but Jared, do you want to? Uh, you've been kind of keeping track. Do we have any that came along that we ought to uh, yeah. take a look at here? We've got uh, a, I'll answer anything. Yeah, what you got? What do we got? All right, we've got a couple of interest. Um, since we were just talking about it, uh, yeah. our friend Chicago and Jared, um, he had a question about your impression of the stereo release of previously mono songs. Um, if you had any kind of opinion on that. Yeah, and I, I, the, I think through. the mono originals are much better, generally speaking. I mean, if it, was, if it wasn't mixed in stereo at the time, um, it probably shouldn't be in my, it doesn't matter. I mean, people can mix it any way they want to. I'm happy to hear new versions of things, but I think the real version will always be the mono version. And besides which, as I said, because of the way we made them back then, they were meant to be mono. You know, that's why those early stereo Beatles records, you get all those weird ones where there's everything's on, all the vocals are on one side and all the right. bands on the other. Yeah. And, you know, we hated that. It, it, but the tr trouble is if you put the vocals where they belong, it's in the middle. If you put the band where it's belong, it's in the middle. So you're back to mono. So, you, you, you know, to make a stereo mix, you have to put things where they shouldn't be. And I think it's generally a mistake. And until you are, they were, until you were on a track, you really can't do a decent stereo mix in terms of the imaging. I remember, the, I yeah. mean, they were pioneers, too, of using stereo with with things going back and forth, you know, as I recall, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Once, once, once that happened. I mean, the early records, you, the pan pots didn't even exist, the knobs that do that. Is that amazing or what? So everything just yeah. had to stay on its side and you couldn't... You, you set it on one side or the other. You couldn't pan it. them back and forth. But No. <clears throat> you know, I... I I meant to ask you a little bit more about Sgt. Pepper's. Were you around during that recording or that? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in the studio, no, hardly ever. I visited maybe once, you know. I never want to give the impression I was I was there all, a lot because I wasn't. But I did get to hear stuff occasionally because Paul would bring it home. He was still in our house at that time. So occasionally I would hear things in progress. And I do remember the day he brought home an acetate of the whole album put together and played it to us, to the whole family, I think just on a regular mono record player, the kind with a lid, you know, and yeah. and uh, in the in our dining room at home. And it sounded amazing, quite amazing. I, I realized it was an important album. I mean, I think that album we, we've all kind of recognized launched, changed rock music forever. Yes, and, indeed it did. And yeah. not, not just the music, but the, the fact that you open this thing up. Well, it was a whole universe that they created their personas yep. and then they had cutouts remember you could you cut out these i i did those cutouts and i put them on cardboard backings and badges uh -huh. and things that nobody had done that kind of thing before again right. another oh. innovation yes brilliant ideas i guess that's i, I i'm not going to keep pressing you on this point but to me the fascination that i have is what drove them did they they just go, wow, we could not only create an album that's going to be totally different, but then we do other things with it. Like we have these inserts and cutouts and it's a double album that you open up and it's, 
this just came out of their spirit of innovation and having well, you know my answer to that question. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I keep and, asking. And nobody knows. I mean, it, they did it the way everyone does it. You have a meeting and say, what are we going to do about the album cover? The difference was they were geniuses and they had were. all these incredible ideas. And the other people meeting somewhere else on another date, some other band were having a meeting about what we're we going to do about the album cover, and nobody had a great idea. And you know, so, said, hmm, whatever, that's our album designer. It, exactly. So they they had brilliant ideas. Um but as we're back to my original thesis, which is as to where brilliant ideas come from, you know, nobody that's a knows. whole other subject. That's a whole other thing. I think that, but you did, you touched on something here, Peter, which is they really involve themselves in so many different aspects that other artists might have just said, "Oh, that's my record company's." Yeah, you know. no, and the, and part of that is ambition. It's an ambition. It's, it's, it is ambition to some degree. They they wanted to be a huge band. They wanted to make better records than anybody they knew, you know. And so they that did. was, a, that and was they a, succeeded. a goal that they had. I mean, I'm not saying that's how it works, but one of the spurs to that kind of activity is certainly ambition. Yeah. Interesting. And we know that. You know, when, when, you, when you read books about, you know, how Newton discovered this, that, and the other, or, you know, it, it, some of it was he wanted to do better than, you know, Leibniz or whoever, whoever the, the Rolling Stones of physics were. And the Rolling Stones of physics. Uh, you know what I mean? It was, it, yeah. Yeah. Plain old ambition and a desire to succeed and beat the next guy is part of it. That's part of what drives mankind. You know, we have that going on today with Elon Musk and, and Tesla yeah. and SpaceX. And, exactly. You know, he's, exactly. he's innovated things that just were sitting there ready to be done. And he came along yep. and did it. Yep. So true. And that's, this is such a key point of all art is, is that willingness and desire to create something new. You know, yes, be, exactly. be fresh and innovate and mm -hmm. take a chance. Maybe it's not going to work, right? I mean, these right. the Beatles were in a fortunate position where we would buy everything that came out. But nonetheless, some albums did better than others, right? Yes. Amazing. Jared, do we have any other questions before we thank yeah. Peter? And I, I have one last question for you. Um, we got a couple questions here. Um, here's one that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, this is from Timothy Rossler uh, earlier in the show. Um, he said that I've read that part of the reason the Beatles were so great was because John Lennon terrified them in brilliance. Is this true? Specifically, they were interested in how hard a creative leader should be versus how nurturing. I, I wonder if you have any perspective on that, having known them. That's interesting. I mean, I didn't know John nearly as well as I knew Paul, but I, I, there was a rivalry there. But I don't, I don't think nobody was terrified. I don't think, and 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 I that that question sort of implicitly implies that John was the leader, and I don't think that's true either. Yeah. Um, uh, I, no, they weren't terrified of John. They John could be, could be grumpy, and he could be in, intense, you know, um, and but. I it basically no. I think I, I don't think that question. I don't think the answer is yes to that question. I think it's more no, not really. Um, yeah, they, they they knew each other too well to be actually scared of each other, in my view. And you can see that you can see the dynamic in in you know <clears throat> their their interaction that whatever we get to see. There is a new f film coming out. You know, Peter Jackson is putting it together. Yeah, but, it was actually when when this when the whole plague thing hit. Last March, I was yeah. actually in London. I was about to see a rough cut of that the following day. And then, then I suddenly had to jump on a plane and come back here. So, no, I haven't seen it except the little clip they put out. The little clip on Apple. Or, yeah. Yeah. But I have had I have the opportunity of speaking briefly about about it with Peter Jackson. And it sounds fantastic. I mean, I cannot wait. I know. Everyone at Apple is amazingly excited, as am I. And uh, Peter Jackson is a genius. And, uh, and I, I think it's going to be amazing. What a different wait. project for him. I mean, you know. Yeah, exactly. But he's a, he's a big fan. It became clear in conversation that he he totally gets it. He's 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 proud to be doing this. And on, on that same note, what do you think about Ron Howard's film Eight Days a Week? I liked it. Um, I I did a lot of interviews with Ron and stuff. I, I've known Ron a long time. We've worked together on some movie soundtracks, and um, I think the movie I think it's terrific. I think it captures those touring years uh, with great accuracy and imagination. I wonder if he's going to do a sequel. I mean, it seemed like it led up to that point where those were the Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. I the two years. 
inside info on that. But yeah. Wonderful. Okay, Peter. Well, listen, it's been brilliant having you on. I do have another question for you. Are, is there sure. any any final advice? Okay, sort of stepping back from your own experience, not just with the Beatles, but you've worked with so many artists. Any piece of advice you would like to leave our, our audience with in terms of just upping your game as a creative? Wow. Wow. Uh, I wish I had some, some generic uh, cure-all. I mean, <laughs> when I the people I see succeeding, I mean, this is a really boring and crappy piece of advice. Is that always that they all have in common that people forget about is just how insanely hard they work. Yes. Um, the, you know, the it, it, this, this sounds really awful. It's very almost parental kind of boring advice. But but the the effectiveness of determination and hard work cannot be overemphasized. You know, Ed Sheeran has become a, a good friend of mine. And if you look at his career and how he did it, and, you know, he has obviously, he's a brilliant composer and an extraordinary songwriter and stuff. But but the other thing that stands out when you look at his career, just like the Beatles, is the determination and the work that went into it, that, you know, he he did something like two thousand gigs before he'd ever got signed to make a record. Um, wow! Um, it, it you know, and and people often ask me, well, you know, if I if I want to make it in the music business or make it in in the creative world, should I be you know uh, should I be putting things up on YouTube? Should I be trying to get a record deal? Should I put them up on iTunes? Should I be um, trying to find a manager? Should I be tr trying to find a producer? Should I get a good lawyer? And, and the answer always is yes. Yes to you all know, those. Check all, all those. the boxes, Just right? Pursue all those things at once. One of them may work. Should yes. you go do gigs to cinema cues busking like Ed did? Yes, if you if you got the nerve to do it and, and got a hat for the pennies to go in, do it. You know, why not? Um, you know, I, I think the answer is try everything and keep working. Well, and the creativity will take care of itself because you, you don't, you can't nurture that so much consciously. You nurture it by just, you know, the, what nurtures your great songwriting is the crap songs you write before you write the great one. So true. That's, you know, really good advice. Working hard. This isn't some magic wand thing that all of a sudden. Sadly, no. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you got to pay your dues and the Beatles paid their dues. They went to Hamburg and played those, yes. those in, in the cavern or whatever it was, 10 hours a day. Yeah, it it does pay off. Well, Peter, thank you so much for joining us and giving giving us this great insight into creativity. It's really helpful. My pleasure. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me. It's it's been nice. It was Absolutely. great. Absolutely. And if you and thank, if, if you don't for mind, the audience. yes, Bye. thank you guys for joining us. And Peter, if you don't mind sticking around for a minute, I'm just going to close out here, and then we'll sure we'll of course. Back. So you guys, wow, awesome. <laughs> I. There's so many things I I could add to this, but I'm not going to. Um, this is there's so many lessons here as far as being a creative, and I think we'll drill down into this in some later videos. But I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so, so you don't miss out what's going on. And the video will be coming up. Uh, will actually stay live, so you know people who weren't here can watch it. And we're also going to edit it. Okay, well, these are many things to absorb over this weekend and uh, get out there. You heard it. Hard work, you guys. <laughs> Just work at it. Get get a bunch of photos. Do your do your creative stuff. You know, get get out there. Roll up your sleeves. Get your hands dirty and and <laughs> make something happen. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. And remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Love you guys. See you soon. Take care.